Support for WPR comes from Boardman Clark, a Wisconsin law firm dedicated to the art of listening and the power of informed discourse, serving businesses, individuals, and local governments throughout the state. BoardmanClark.com. It's Central Time. I'm Rob Ferrett. You're with us here on the Ideas Network. Coming up, we'll hear about the early days of the AIDS epidemic with a memoir of love and tragic loss. First, this weekend, a global ransomware cyber attack hit 150 countries. Ransomware is a type of virus that locks a user's computer until the user pays to release it. The attack started slowing down Monday. Apparently, only about $50,000 has been paid so far. Dave Schrader joins us now to talk about what happened this weekend and how you can protect yourself from this and maybe future ransomware attacks. He's a strategist for the Division of Information Technology at UW-Madison. Dave, thanks a lot for joining us today. Hey, Rob. My pleasure. Thanks. Well, first of all, Dave, tell us what happened over the weekend. This got this spread quickly around the world. It did. So this ransomware uh, you've seen referred to as either WannaCrypt or WannaCry, and uh, it started spreading uh, largely in organizations that had computers that were not patched, that weren't up to date with the latest security fixes from Microsoft. And if you were infected, uh, what a what a user would see when they turned on their computer is this box would pop up saying, oops, your important files have been encrypted and give them a warning that they needed to pay uh, within a week if they wanted to see those files again. And this is not the first ransomware attack we've seen. This is one element of of cyber problems that we're seeing, isn't it? Yes, that's right. There's uh, there's ransomware is not new. Um, it's a type of malicious software that, uh, just like you said, uh, encrypts a user's files um, with strong encryption. Sometimes it's even the same encryption that you're using legitimately on your devices to protect. Uh, your own files. Uh, if someone steals your device or uh, gets a hold of your data, and they won't be able to encrypt it and if they don't have the right password or passcode. But in this case, it's an attacker encrypting your files with their encryption key, and you don't have access to those files then. Unless you pay them the ransom in bitcoins in this case, uh... Is, what's the advice generally if a, an individual user or a company or a hospital, as was the case here, are, should people pay to get access to their own files? Well, the, the, the situation is difficult if you don't have that data backed up. So in certain cases, uh, there, there might be an instance where someone has, uh, has backups, but they're old, and, uh, you know, and there's no way that uh, security firms have developed to actually decrypt these files. Sometimes security firms are able to reverse engineer ransomware and provide tools that people can use to decrypt, your, to decrypt those files and get access to them again. But in this case, there is no fix other than paying the attackers. And, you know, some people may choose to pay because if they don't have uh, access to backups or they really need those files back, you know, sometimes they determine that uh, the quickest path is just to pay. And unfortunately, you're really giving money to criminals, essentially, at that point. But sometimes there's no other option. Where are we now, uh, now that it's Monday on this? I understand uh, one user found some kind of kill switch to, to shut down this ransomware attack. Does that mean the problem's over or just morphing as we watch? Well, there was a security expert at a uh, outfit called Malware Tech who... Uh, registered a domain name, uh, you know, which is something like, you know, whatever.com or what, what have you, that he found embedded in the malware. And he registered it to try to track the malware and see if he could find out more about where it was coming from, how it was controlled. And it turned out that the act of him registering this domain name uh, ended up killing one variant of this ransomware and not allowing it to spread further. But we've already seen other variants of this ransomware out there. And over the weekend, we didn't really know, uh, you know, when Monday rolled around, uh, would people go to their desks in their office and find, you know, this ransomware was on their computers. And fortunately, it it doesn't look like there was any uh, big explosion, but it's still spreading. And, uh, and, And as you said, it's been seen in over 150 countries, and it's affected thousands of people. And that $50,000 that we sort of assess has been paid to whoever's behind this ransomware 
might not seem like a lot of money, but, but you know, with ransomware, it could be anything from, uh, you know, a, a large criminal cyber gang to just one individual. And $50,000, depending on where you are in the world, could be a lot of money. We're talking to Dave Schrader from UW-Madison's Division of Information Technology, looking at this big cyber hostage-taking ransomware attack that uh, started on Friday, still going on in uh, varying forms around the world. Dave, uh, people listening are probably thinking, okay, I don't want these things to happen to my computer, my workplace, whatever. What kind of advice is out there? What should we be doing? Well, the best advice is the same advice that people have probably heard many times, which is keep your computers and your devices up to date with the latest security patches and never click links, download attachments, or things like that in email messages that are unsolicited or unexpected. Now, in the case of this WannaCrypt ransomware, a user didn't actually have to click anything to become infected. It was using a vulnerability, actually quite an old vulnerability in Microsoft Windows to spread itself. So in addition to being ransomware, it was also acting as a worm. A worm is a type of malware that will try to spread on its own by searching other computers, either on the local network or even out on the internet. And if it finds one that has this vulnerability, it will go ahead and infect that computer too. Now, people have been criticizing the NSA, the National Security Agency, apparently knowing about this vulnerability, not revealing it until it was it was leaked. What do we know about that? So uh, what we know is that there was a group, uh, another group whose identity uh, we don't actually know, called the Shadow Brokers, that has been leaking what are purported to be tools that, uh, you know, may be cyber weapons that are used to exploit vulnerabilities in computer systems and software that aren't known by the manufacturers of that software. So the United States uh, typically discloses vulnerabilities that it discovers, uh, including the intelligence community, but the practice is that some vulnerabilities that are viewed to be important that might be used for uh, foreign intelligence purposes are kept. And this is a controversial practice because it means those vulnerabilities are still out there until someone else publicly discovers them or leaks them, as in the case of the shadow brokers. So once this vulnerability was leaked, uh, the intelligence community did inform the vendors, hey, we think that uh, you know there's a vulnerability here that needs to be fixed that you should be aware of. Microsoft did issue a patch uh, so anyone who had updated their systems um, o over the last few months uh, was already not vulnerable to this particular problem. But it was such an old vulnerability that Microsoft actually also released a patch for Windows XP, which is a version of Windows that uh, you know, came out before 9-11, just to give a little bit of perspective, and uh, also hadn't received any security updates for almost a decade. Uh, until now. So they released a patch for that, too. The problem with uh, things like Windows XP, a lot of people might wonder, well, who, who's still using that? And there are a lot of organizations out there, um, government organizations, healthcare organizations, companies that have these older systems around for a variety of reasons um, or have Windows systems around that might not be patched. And these are the ones that were the most heavily affected by it. And Dave, as we wrap up, just reiterating the point, it sounds like uh, if we think that updating our virus software or getting virus software in the first place is a drag, we should just uh, grin and bear it and actually should, do the work? Exactly. You should just do it. And when Windows or, or your iPhone or anything is, is coming around reminding you, hey, there's a security update that's available, you know, it's always a hassle to install it. But please just go ahead and install those updates. Keep your security software current. And even though it wasn't an issue in this case, you know, this was an issue with the Google Docs phishing scam that, that we see, saw a couple of weeks ago. Um, another common way for ransomware or malicious software to spread is those phishing emails. So, again, you know, don't click, don't download attachments, especially if you're getting a message that's unexpected or unsolicited, because if it seems fishy, it probably is. Dave, thanks a lot for joining us today. Thanks. Take care.
That's Dave Schrader, strategist for the Division of Information Technology at UW-Madison. He joined us to talk about the global ransomware attack this weekend.